Would you pray with me and for me, please? Heavenly Father, we do. We come before you today and we say our hearts are ready. Lord, our minds are, are just at the ready to receive your word. And our hearts, Lord, are ready to be offered to you in worship. And again, Lord, just fill our worship. Make it bigger, make it better, make it greater that your heart may be delighted in the offering that we give to you this day. May you be pleased, O Lord. May you be glorified. And may you, Lord, the God of peace, be upon your people this day. In Christ's name, amen. amen. As I started to uh, work on today's sermon, one of the things that kind of struck me was that at the coming of every pivotal moment in the life and ministry of Jesus, there's an event that takes place that equips him, encourages him, and anoints him for what comes next. I say this because I not only want us to recognize that this is true, but I want us to understand just as this is true for Jesus, we, and we will see it today, this is also true for each one of us. And so I want your minds to be expanded to understand that there is an equipping, an encouraging, an anointing that the Lord places on each of us at pivotal moments in our life. Now Jesus became flesh and blood and while his purpose was to die, paying the price of our sin, gaining victory over sin and death, accomplishing our salvation, Jesus also models as, and is an example for us as we live our daily lives, and especially when facing our own challenges. Today's gospel is one of those pivotal moments in Jesus' life from which we can gain insight and wisdom, if we will. Today, I pray that we will feed on the truth of this passage, letting wisdom have her way that we may gain knowledge and that with that knowledge, we advance into understanding a fuller and more powerful understanding that prepares us, equips us, and yes, even anoints us for what comes next. Now we're in the season of Epiphany, the manifestation of Christ to the Gentiles represented by the visit of the Magi. This is also at the beginning of our liturgical year. So you might say each one of us are in the beginning of a new season with our Lord. Now there is another definition of epiphany, and that is it's a moment of sudden insight or understanding, what I would call one of those aha moments, a surprising moment when the light dawns and something we didn't know or understand fully surprisingly, suddenly becomes crystal clear. I believe we all are at a pivotal moment, not only personally, but in our church life. The beginning of a new season, the beginning of a new year, the beginning of new or at least fresh insight and wisdom the beginning of what comes next. It's my prayer that each of you have an aha moment that surprises you today and that moves you from where you are right this very minute to a decidedly better place and position with our Lord. Jesus is in the synagogue reading from the scroll of Isaiah, ending with these words, today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. 
We will get to what that means in a moment. But first, let's see what led to this astounding, amazing, surprising proclamation. What has gone before? As I already mentioned, it was the manifestation of Christ to the Magi, to the Gentiles. Then fleeing into Egypt to protect him from the murderous Herod. The return from Egypt to Nazareth, where we are told the child grew and became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God upon him. At 12, he is found in the temple, astounding the teachers with his wisdom. But as he says simply, I'm about my father's business. Next, we have his baptism in the Jordan by John the Baptist, that scripture might be fulfilled. This is one of those extraordinary events of anointing. The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descends upon him and the voice of God saying, you are my beloved son and in you, I am well pleased. What comes next? What is he being prepared for? Immediately, he is driven by the Holy Spirit into the desolate, dangerous wilderness to prove he is the Son of God by defeating Satan in open combat demonstrating the anointing has prepared and equipped him with an incre incredible authoritative power. The anointing and favor of his father results in him overcoming every, every temptation. This flesh and blood Jesus remains sinless in the wilderness. His wilderness experience has much for us to learn, and it deserves a sermon or sermons all on this one event alone. However, not our gospel for today. So let me offer just these few thoughts, which I believe are insight and wisdom that comes straight from God to us concerning our own wilderness experiences. In the baptism, the voice of God giving favor, assuring Jesus, you are my son, I am well pleased. Immediately, he is driven into the wilderness by the Spirit. The insight and wisdom we are given in this, God's leading and favor doesn't guarantee us safety from hurt or harm. It doesn't guarantee us protection from the unfairness of life. It doesn't free us from the temptations. In reality, God's Spirit will lead us into the wilderness places to challenge and stretch our dependence and faith. In these pivotal moments, we will find our lives are being refined in his refiner's fire, building our strength of character that our resolve to trust matures our faith. Just as God's spirit drove Jesus into the wilderness, so we too may be driven into our own wilderness. And believe me, it's not a place that we really want to go but we can most surely expect we will be facing the temptations of Satan. And we can expect exposure to the world with both its wonders and its dangers. Our takeaway, Jesus received what was needed in his wilderness experience, and so will we. God's favor and assurance that he is with us and we are his child. In the wilderness, 
There was the Holy Spirit, Jesus, and Satan. In our wilderness, there is the Holy Spirit, us, and Satan. Every temptation Jesus met with the Word of God. Do you know, do you realize, we can meet every temptation that we experience with the Word of God? We just need to spend time in it, and we need to know it. Consider this a word to the wise. Scripture is absolutely necessary for our daily life. Jesus emerged stronger, resolute, strengthened, and ready for what came next. And we too can emerge stronger, resolute, strengthened, and ready for what comes next. And it says, Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and a report about him went through all the surrounding country, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. Jesus begins his ministry. Now, in other gospel accounts, we get a fuller picture of this Jesus as he returns from the wilderness to Galilee. Scripture says he returns in the power of the Spirit. He went about with a visible, steadfast, authoritative teaching and preaching the kingdom of God. As many as were brought to him were healed. The beginning of his mission and ministry in authority, in power, in miracles began to spread throughout the country, bringing us to today's passage when he comes back home to Nazareth. And he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up and was as was his custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day. Now Jesus is well known in Nazareth. He grew up in this synagogue. Now it is clear that the reports of what he had been doing had gotten back to his hometown to those who knew him, who had watched him grow up. So familiarity is at foot here as well as what I believe is a pregnant expectation. I imagine as he enters the synagogue, there is an electrical charged atmosphere. The intensity of this moment is palpable. Before we get there, let me give you an idea of the flow of the synagogue worship. The Shema is recited. The Shema being, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And then silently is said, blessed be the name of his glorious kingdom forever and ever. Then comes the reading of benedictions, a psalm, a priestly blessing, a reading from the Torah, and a reading from the prophets followed by an interpretation. And then scripture says, and he stood up to read. And the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to pray, proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now it's not clear, but it does seem likely that Jesus deliberately chose this particular Isaiah passage. And I believe his purpose is twofold. One, he is making an intentional declaration announcing he is the long-promised, long-awaited, anointed one, the Messiah. And two, to announce his commission and to whom he is sent, 
to whom his mission and ministry would be directed. The scripture is very clear. Jesus is sent by God to proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Now in the fullness of the meaning and the depth of this prophecy, we can see he is not sent to the powerful, to the rich, to court their favor. He is sent to the disenfranchised, to those who have been cast aside, left out, or, or ignored. He has been sent to those who have been treated unfairly, who have no social or political standing. And while we cannot leave out this literal, outward, physical description, we must also apply and understand this also includes the spiritual dimensions of poverty, of captivity, of blindness. As he read, Jesus is speaking these words of prophecy about himself. His time had come, was fully here. He is the anointed one sent from God, ushering in a new covenant of grace. And just as he used the word of God to meet every temptation, defeating Satan, he uses the word of God to announce who he is and what his work will be. With the word, he proclaims good news to the poor, proclaims freedom to the captives, lights the darkness, giving sight to the blind, and sets free those that are oppressed. And then he sets to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, all present would know exactly what those words meant. He is referring to the Jubilee year. God established an, an institution in the Old Testament called the year of Jubilee. It's in Leviticus. Every 50th year, Israel was to take the whole year off, not two weeks, the whole year, cancel all debts, return to its original owners all family property that had been sold, set the slaves free, and proclaim liberty throughout the land. The year of Jubilee is actually an Old Testament foreshadowing of the freedom in Christ and the covenant of grace. In other words, every 50 years, the past was to be left in the past, giving everyone a fresh start. If you will, the beginning of a new season of equality, kindness, generosity, forgiveness. He is proclaiming for those present today, I bring good news to the poor. Today, I proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. Today, I give freedom to the oppressed. Today is the year of the Lord's favor. Now comes the kicker. And he rolled up the scroll and he gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, to them today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. One might say this is the shortest sermon in history. And likely to stay the shortest sermon in history. This ancient prophecy is fulfilled in him who is reading the words. The old covenant of the law and the prophets is drawing to an end. The new covenant of grace is established at the beginning of Jesus's ministry. Now, favor is hard to define, but it's not very difficult to describe. 
favor is an invitation to let the past be the past. Entering into freedom with new confidence, trusting Jesus to be with us and for us, knowing that he has gone before us. As I mentioned, we are in the season of Epiphany. We are in a new season, a new year, and we are being invited into a new beginning. For those who have ears to hear, we can decide this will be our Jubilee year marked with freedom, forgiveness, restoration, generosity, kindness, abundance, and joy. Is there anything on that list that you don't want? Okay. The invitation is to those who have been driven into the wilderness. Doesn't matter when, where, or how long ago. The invitation is those who have succumbed to the tempter and have been or were taken captive. Doesn't matter how, doesn't matter what. The invitation is to those who can admit their own frailty and inability to figure it out, whatever it is. It is for those who finally realize that all their thinking, all their planning, trying to get over it, trying to move beyond it, just isn't working. Because the wilderness is still a desolate, dangerous, confusing, lonely place. Make no mistake, no one, no one, escapes the wilderness experience or its effects, sometimes even its long-term effects. Very often, we shockingly find ourselves ruled by the past operating in the present. Walking out of the wilderness is not at all easy. Living with the burden of its effects we have a very real enemy lurking in the shadows at the ready to strike and does strike when our vulnerabilities are exposed. The human condition means we all face challenges of living, illnesses, loss of things that are precious or important to us violated expectations, being hurt by the words or the actions of another. Grief, death, betrayal, disappointments, loneliness, being afraid or scared, failures, being sinned against, and a host of other things that I haven't even mentioned. All these are filtered through our own personal perceptions. Good news to the poor, that would be you and me. Today we are being invited by Jesus himself into the year of the Lord's favor. The invitation is to those who are ready to be yoked with Christ not in word only, because it's easy to say, I'm yoked with Christ. Not to the one who wants to put being yoked with Christ on some higher, loftier plane that will happen later. It is actually giving him the weight of our burdens now that we can like him, emerge from the wilderness, knowing that by this experience, we are prepared, equipped, anointed, made ready for what comes next, because we have been strengthened in our resolve 
with faith on the rise, trusting Jesus when he proclaims freedom from our captivity, when he recovers sight to our blindness, when he frees us from the burdens that oppress us, when he proclaims today begins the year of the favor of our Lord. Do we believe that? Do we hear those words and do we believe it? Believe him? That's what remains upon hearing him accepting that invitation by believing him when he says, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Will you let this new year be a fresh start into the new covenant of grace, letting Jesus comfort you, letting him free you, letting him heal you, letting him strengthen you, letting him bless you with the abundance of life, delighting him that your joy may be made full. Folks, this is big. This is great. This is at the ready. It's an invitation. Step in. Accept it. Jesus is not a reluctant redeemer. He is not a reluctant restorer for the burdened, for the weary, for the broken, even for those who think they may have it all together, or for those who are simply resigned. That's just the way it is. Let us not be reluctant to accept this invitation, to be moved from where you are right now into a better place. I want to provoke you because believe me, I was provoked. I want you to think on this, the favor of the Lord. I want you to see that the favor of the Lord is tangible evidence that you have his approval, meaning when you have it, you will know it. You don't have to ask. You don't have to say to someone, do you see the Lord's favor on me? You will know it. Isaiah 66, verse 2 says this. These are the ones I look on with favor. Those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. Are you in scripture every single day? If you're not, decide to be there every single day. Day, it's important. If you want to meet the temptations that come your way, if you want to climb out of the places that you've agreed to allow yourself to be led, then you need the Word of God. You need it. Be in it. Know it. Know this. An outward, inward expression of favor is delight. To have his favor is to know that he delights in you. When I think of that, the Lord delighting in me, the picture that comes to mind is this just joyful, bouncy child just lit up with happiness and with joy and with excitement. The Lord delights in you. Do you 
delight in him? Do you delight in his word? Or do you just not have time? Delight does not happen without intentionality. Know this, an outward and inward expression of favor is delight. Finally, Jesus says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Believing in the power of the Holy Spirit, resolve to accept his invitation, walking into this new year of the favor of the Lord because you are prepared, you have been equipped, you are anointed for what comes next. And in that is the assurance that his favor is upon you. Amen. Amen.